Welcome to another week of Sunday School with the Deke. I uh, want to first of all thank everybody for all the wonderful responses that we've been getting over the past few weeks. And thank you for all the comments and encouragement that you guys have been giving me. Um, it's just been a real blessing to me and to the Sunday School Ministry. Now I do want to remind you to hit the subscribe button at the bottom of the page and the little bell. And that way each week you'll be notified when the Deke has uploaded another lesson. Um, I do want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers watching today. Um, and if you still have your mother, consider yourselves blessed. Um, and if on this day you are remembering your mother, um, I want you to bask in the memory of her and uh, make them proud by being the child that they raised you to be and by being a good mother to your kids if, if you're a mother. Um, so I just want to say Happy Mother's Day, especially to my mom, uh, who I'm just so blessed to have, uh, Sister Shirley. I call her Sure Dog, um, but I just want to say I love you and thank you for everything. Happy Mother's Day. All right, let's get into the lesson. This is our second week in the book of Zephaniah, part two, if you will. We spent the last week digging deep into the words that God had to give to Zephaniah, to give to the people of Judah. Um, and it's been a message of, of telling the people that God was not happy with their ways. God had not been happy for a long time, but yet he, he continued to bless them and continued to send them prophets to tell them that they need to get their act together. Um, the people continued to do what they wanted to do and didn't heed to the warnings of God, and that's kind of how we got to where we are today. Uh, last week, uh, we went over the first eight verses, uh, and so the, the, the lesson ended in verse eight, where God told Zephaniah to tell them that he, the day is going to come where he's going to pour out all his indignation, all his anger on all the people, um, all the nations, not just Judah, but all the nations. And um, one of the words you're going to hear here in this lesson is um, the word remnant. Uh, remnant is a piece of something that's left from a larger something, right? And that's, that's the Deke's definition. Um, you hear the word remnant all the time in the carpet industry, right? When you put a carpet down in your house and then there's some, some pieces of carpet left over, that's called a remnant. Right. So it's not the whole carpet, but it's part of the whole carpet. Right. Uh, that was left. So here in this lesson, God refers to the remnant as those few people that he will still have that are going to worship and honor him. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and get into the lesson. Um, first, let's read last week's uh, the ending of last week, which was verse eight, uh, just to refresh our memory of where we left off. I'm going to read verse 8 for you, and it says, Therefore, wait upon ye upon me, said the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger for all the earth, shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So he just told them that his plans were to gather all the nations and pour out his indignation and his fierce anger on them for their disobedience. And if you remember last week's lesson was entitled Consequences for the Disobedient. Um, so God is angry, y'all. He's angry at his people and he's telling them through Zephaniah uh, that they're going to go through a form of punishment. And we know it now because we have our Bibles. We know that it was for 70 years of bondage under Babylonian rule. But 
Uh, but here he says it's not going to be only for his chosen people, but for all the nations that had anything to do with their influence on his people turning away from him. And so God was not happy with his people um, and they have to pay, of course, but he's also not happy with those other nations that influenced them to worship their gods, their idol gods, and, and, and to have his people kind of stray away from him. And um, ultimately, I understand we're all responsible uh, for our own actions, uh, but God will, and he shows us here in this verse that he will also deal with those who influence you to be bad or to sin. Okay, I'm, I'm starting to get back into last week's lesson, so I don't want to do that again. So let's go ahead and get into verse, verse 9. For then I will turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So Zephaniah spent the first eight verses of this chapter talking about the doom and gloom that was headed for Judah, right? In verse 8, which I just read you, he said the judgment was going to come upon them. Now in verse 9, he's switching the conversation. And see, you have to study this word to know the tide of the speech um, has changed from verse 8 to verse 9. In this case, I'm speaking of when they come out of bondage from, from Babylon. So verse 8, he tells of his anger and what he's going to do. And then verse 9 switches to how it's going to be once they come out of bondage. So I know some of you have studied deep into this lesson and know that he's also talking about when Jesus comes back to earth the second time, uh, um, when all Christians have gone to heaven. And Zephaniah's words here are speaking of that as well. Um, but we're going to only be focusing on what Zephaniah meant for the then and there, right then and there, not about the future, because I don't want to get all deep into that uh, in this Sunday school lesson. So, um, and I believe this can be, this is a message for us during this pandemic as well, right? God is letting them know that even though they're going to go through some terrible things, that he's still going to be there with them when they come out on the other side. So he's letting them know that um, that it'll be they'll come out better than what they went in, right? So please know, I need you to understand that sometimes we have to accept our fate with God. We do, you know. I know we don't like to hear that, but sometimes we're just gonna have to go through it. Uh, and I know a lot of people listening to this this uh, lesson can raise their hand and say Amen because they've gone through it. Um, but just like he's telling Judah, he tells us the same thing. A better day is coming, right? He says here that once the rain is over, there will be a better day for all of them. And see, God, God is not like us, y'all. And I'm so thankful that God is not like us because we can hold a grudge. You know what I'm saying? Us humans, us Christians. And I thank God. He don't have the spirit of some of us because we would be hit. I'm telling you, he's so merciful and he's so full of grace. Um, I'm just so thankful that, you know, so here, even though he has not put his people through this punishment yet, he's already talking about how he's going to bless them when they come out of it. Ain't that, so, ain't that good, y'all? God is so good. Now, that is love. That is the epitome of love. The, and we're going to get more into that next week. I'm telling you, next week is going to be a fantastic lesson. Um, but this is not the only place where we read God talking to us like this. David wrote in Psalms 30 and 5, for his anger endureth but a moment. Right? In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. See, God is not like us. He, he, he says... His anger only endures for a minute, just for a moment. You know, he, as bad as these people were, he's, he's not going to stay angry with them. So let's get back to the lesson. He says, then I will turn to the people a pure language. So 
this is talking about when he says then I will pour, then I will pour. He's saying uh, after the wrath is over, after their punishment is done, after they come out of bondage, a day when their language will be pure. And not everyone, not, not saying that everybody is going to speak the same language, but everybody is going to speak the same holy things, right? Everyone will speak godly things and not negative stuff, right? So a day when people, when their speech will reflect God, the God that they serve. Let's talk about that for a second. If you think about it, from our lips comes some nasty stuff. Let's just be honest. Some terrible things. Um, and I'm talking about the things that come off the lips of the people that call themselves Christians. That's the only people I'm really talking about right now. Let me just say this. Many of us get our language from those who we grew up with, right? So if your mom and daddy cuss like a sailor, then most likely the kids going to cuss like little baby sailors. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but here's what I don't understand. Because God is our father. <laughs> um... But yet, we don't speak godly things. <sighs> um, when Jesus walked this earth, he spoke nothing but love. He spoke nothing but peace um, and goodwill towards men. Our speech needs to mirror that. Because um, we're his children, right? Unless we ain't living in the same house as our father. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you see where I'm going with this? Um, maybe if we don't spend much time around them, we don't talk like them. Like, come on, somebody. Am I knocking? I'm knocking. I know I'm knocking, but am I coming in? So uh, I'm just saying. But anyway, my grandmother used to say, uh, if you throw a rock and a crowd of dogs, the one that it hit, one that it hits will holler. So... I can't hear no hollering, so maybe I ain't hitting nobody. Anyway, Zephaniah speaks of the day when God's people all, their speech will be purified. Not just a few, but the whole nation will be back where they uh, need to be. And please remember that sometimes God puts you through something just to get you back where you need to be. Um, I believe this pandemic is bringing many of us back to where we need to be. He says, they will call upon my name of the Lord and not the name of, of the sun God or the moon God and all those other things that they were doing before God put them in this judgment. He said, they're going to call upon my name. And, and, and I'll say, and I'm going to say the same thing about us. When we come out of this pandemic, we're going to be calling on the name of the Lord and not everything that we've been worshiping more than God before we went into this thing. Because we, we have everything has been on, our attention has been on everything but God. It says they will serve, they will all serve him together on one accord. And look, wanting to do it, not out of obligation, not because, but because they want to. And they won't be going to church out of, you know, out of obligation, um, not because they got to sing that week or they got to usher that week. Uh, you know, people, people feel like they don't have to come to church. Uh, on the weeks that they ain't got to do nothing. Uh, or they have it in their head that they're going to give God two weeks a month. That's all he's going to get. And, you know, they may mix them around, but he's he going to get his two. Um, and come hell or high water, I'm just going to give him two. And, 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 man, but what do you do when it has five Sundays? Whew, that puts a dilemma in the, in the mix. <laughs> okay. And I can't say that I wouldn't be like that either if I didn't serve as a deacon or, or a Sunday school teacher where I have to, which forces me to be there every week. Um, but I grew up in a house where Sunday meant church. And uh, that's all I know. Uh, and now I'm putting the same thing into my kids. Um, I digress. But here God is saying there won't, that won't be the case anymore. People are going to come to church because they want to. Verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants... Even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. Okay, so here he's saying there will be a day when all of Israel 
will return to God. That's what we just talked about. He said he's going to purify their speech. Um, it says even the northern and the southern kingdoms are going to come back together. And see, this is a glimpse of what's happening at that time. Um, you remember when God had scattered the people in Genesis um, chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel? Um, if, if you don't remember, I'm going to tell you that the, the people tried to build a tower up to heaven. And God got really angry and said, you know, if they're acting like this uh, as one to do this type of thing, uh, then what other type of evil things could they do if they really put their heads together? Um, so it was at that point in the Bible that God confused their languages, right? Because up until the 11th chapter of Genesis, everybody spoke one language. Um, but in the 11th chapter of Genesis, God confused their languages so that they couldn't understand each other uh, anymore. And they could no longer try to accomplish the things that they were trying to accomplish. So, But up until that point, the whole world was only going to speak one language forever. Um, now here in verse and now here in this verse, God tells Zephaniah to tell them that no matter where they are, no matter what languages they, they're now speaking, they're going to all come back to God at this point in time. And, and they're going to come from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And that's just God's way of saying um, he's going to call the people back from uh, wherever they are at that time, all the, the areas of the earth. Um, and then, like I said, here in verse 9, it says they will all be on one accord. Uh, he calls them suppliants. A suppliant, and I looked it up, is someone who begs or prays for something. And to be a suppliant is to humbly pray and ask for forgiveness. So, here by God calling them suppliants, he's saying that the, the people are going to come back to him after this time in bondage with a humble way of, of, of asking him and begging him for forgiveness. They're going to be a different kind of people. They're not going to be full of pride. And, and so he, he's already telling them how they're going to come out of this. Um, how many people, you know, you know, it's a good guy that's, that's at least going to tell you, hey, I, I got to punish you for what you did, but also tells you, hey, this is how you're going to come out of it. This is how I'm going to do it. And this is how you're going to be and, and all of that. I mean, he doesn't have to give them this, but he's giving them this. Um, and, and then here he says uh, the offering that he refers to in this verse. He's talking about themselves. God loves it when he has you. Not just a piece of you, but all of you. And, and, and when you can offer yourselves as an offering to God, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, we, you know we, the church needs your offering, your monetary offering, but God also needs you, your mind, your body, and your soul. So anyway, let's go to verse 11. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings. Man, this is good. Wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of the them that rejoice in thy pride and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain all right you're like man that was, that was a long verse and i don't understand nothing that he was talking about so look here in verse 11 zephaniah brings back the focus to the people that he started um this chapter talk, started this chapter talking to. Because remember last week, he focused on, on Jerusalem, right? He opened up the verse last week. Very first verse in chapter 3 says, Woe unto her. Remember that? And he called Jerusalem filthy and uh, polluted and oppressed. Um, now, wouldn't you be ashamed if God called you filthy and polluted and oppressed? I, I know I talked about this last week. Um, well, here's the good news about what God called them last week. God forgets everything that happened in the past. I want to jump out this seat, but I'm going to go off camera. But look, he, he, God forgets everything that happens in the past. We got to remember that when we repent and we ask God for forgiveness, our sins are thrown into the abyss. 
right? They're gone. Never to be remembered again. Um, he's not like us as humans. We forgive, but we don't forget, right? Um, and this is the same God that called them filthy, polluted, and oppressed in verse 1. But here in verse 11, he says to them, when the judgment is over and you come back to the Lord, you won't have to be ashamed of what you did in the past. Oh, my God. See, when you're a child of God, you should be ashamed of your actions when, 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 when you completely turn against God. And like I told you um, last week, these people were not ashamed at all. These people loved what they were doing, and they couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> if you remember last week's lesson in verse 7, God said to Zephaniah uh, to tell the people that he surely thought that they was going to get their act together after he saw what he did to the, all them other nations. He said, I surely thought that y'all was going to get your act together. But they didn't. You remember that? Um, so, but look, so think about that and think about this verse. Um, uh, in this verse, God is saying those days will be over. That they won't have to be ashamed by their actions anymore. They won't have to be ashamed about what they were doing in verses 1 through 8. Um, because he said, you, you're not even going to resemble those type of people that transgressed against me. You're not even going to look like that anymore. And if for some reason, and that's where we get into the second part of this verse. If for some reason there are a few people who still want to revert back to their old ways, you don't have to worry about them because they will be removed. That's what the verse says. That's what the verse says. Look, look at it. Look what it says. It says all the people who are filled with pride, all the people who are arrogant, all the people who are haughty, uh, thinking that they're better than others, right, will be gone from their midst. That's what the verse says. And it's hard. It's hard to get prideful, arrogant, haughty people to serve the Lord. You know why? Because that would mean it would have to be about something or somebody other than themselves. See, God can't use people like that. God, Christianity is, is all about others. And Christianity is selfless. Uh, it's about others. And so arrogant and prideful and haughty people are about, are about themselves. That's who they're about. And so the two don't mix. And so, you know, they want praise for themselves, so it's hard for them to give praise to God. And so God understands this, and so he tells Zephaniah to tell the people that those people will be removed from your midst because it's now going to be back to being all about God. Uh, so in verse 8, in the first, first eight verses of this chapter, they were being judged uh, um, about being for themselves and not being about God. And so we as Christians should never be satisfied in sin. Even though all the leaders in Jerusalem were sinning against God, no one has shamed in doing that. They didn't care, right? So, but when you're a true child of God, you don't enjoy living in sin. There's always something on the inside that's just pulling at you. And that's the Holy Spirit pulling at you about this ain't right, right? So if you're a pig, you love being in, in the pig pen. You love slop. You love mud. Uh, and I'm talking about a real physical pig. <laughs> um, but if you're not a pig, you know, I, I dare say Christians, it, 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 we're not pigs. So you don't love being in the pig pen. You don't love being in the mud. Now you might be in it and it might feel good at the time, but something about it just don't make you feel at home. And so God is telling us here that there will be a day when you will no longer have to be ashamed for the state in which you find yourself in. And, and that's so good. He said, I'm going to, once I bring you through this, you ain't got to worry. You don't have to walk back to me ashamed because to me, it never happened. And so lastly, I just want to comment on the verse about being haughty because of the holy mountain. 
if you read that verse. See, these people of Judah were very prideful and they were, they were very prideful people because many felt that they were better than other nations because they had the holy mountain. What's the holy mountain? Jerusalem, Zion. God, that's where God and that's where the temple was. And so they knew God was there, the temple was there, and that was their place of residence. And so they felt like they were better than other nations. Um, and so the holy mountain represented God and it was understood by everybody that God's people lived on this holy mountain and it separated them from others. And so he said they had become haughty because of the holy mountain. And, and they, they looked at this difference in themselves to make them feel like they were better than other nations. And so God is saying here in this verse that they're not going to have to worry about that attitude anymore because guess what? The holy mountain is going to be gone because when they get put in bondage, the whole country of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. There won't be a holy mountain. So what are you going to be all haughty about? <laughs> oh, man. Um, but I will try to bring this to the day. And let me just say that we should not get caught up in our own holy mountains, uh, feeling like that we're better than others because um, our church building is better than somebody else's church building. You got 3,000 seats and somebody else had 30 seats. That, it's, not, it's not about that, you know. You got all these amenities and online services and streaming and all the various uh, things that are offered like child care or youth programs or, you know, having three or four services during the day or five or six choirs or, or thousands of members. I mean, we can't get caught up in our holy mountain. You can't sit there and say to someone, y'all don't have such and such or y'all don't have. You can't be that way. Everybody, God didn't make every congregation the same. Um, and nobody is better in God's eyes. Uh, he's not a respecter of persons. Anyway, I digress. Let's go to verse 12. Make sure my timer is working here. Don't want to get off. Uh, don't want to go too long. All right. So let's go to verse 12. Verse 12. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. So basically what he's saying here is that once he has removed all the arrogant people, all the haughty people, all the prideful people, what is going to be left is nothing but the kind of people that can tr trust and serve God. The lowly, the humble ones who don't think highly of themselves, um, that's the type of people that God wants to serve him. Uh, and he uses the word afflicted and poor, um, but that's just another way of saying lowly and humble. Because when you're lowly and humble, you can trust God. You don't trust in yourself. You don't trust in your money. You don't trust in all these other things in your life. You give it all up to the Lord. And I have to say this before, and I, I've said it before, and I know I, I'll say it again. That all throughout the Bible, God continues to take care of the poor, um, the afflicted, the downtrodden. And it's our responsibility to do the same thing. Um, because if you look at the attitudes of the poor and the afflicted and the downtrodden, it's all an attitude of need. Um, an attitude of not being about themselves. And so... Knowing and understanding that, um, uh, knowing and understanding that they need help, the attitude that we as Christians need to take uh, is that we need to realize that we have everything we have, not because of us, but because it was given to us. And we should all have a thankful nature because God has looked at us and supplied all of our needs, right? Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 5 uh, about the Beatitudes it was um, it was so important that in, this was Jesus's first sermon that he ever did and he opened up his first sermon he ever did uh, by talking about blessed are the poor in spirit mean and, 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 and so what is what does it mean to be spiritually poor it to be poor in spirit is to recognize that you're utterly spiritually bankrupt 
before God and, and you understand that you have absolutely nothing to give to offer him that's worth anything. Um, so being sp spiritually poor is admitting that, um, that because of your sin, you are completely bankrupt uh, spiritually and you, you can't do anything without God. Uh, so Jesus is saying that he opens up his beatitudes with that said no matter what your status is in life You got to recognize that you're spiritually poor. You're spiritually poor And when you be able to become to realize that you can come before God in faith and receive the salvation That he came to offer us But then he also followed up those that first beatitude with the second one, which was blessed are the meek And that was the disciple people that he's talking about here uh, lowly and downtrodden people who are meek have that type of attitude and then he also comes with blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness so yeah, he this Bible is just so awesome uh, Bible so awesome but I won't get into it let's get back into the lesson verse 13 and our last verse the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So, uh, the word remnant here, I told you, is, is important in both the Old Testament and New Testament, um, but the concept of remnant was introduced when Noah, with Noah and the flood. Um, in that story, if you remember, God destroyed all of the evil population, but he saved the righteous, which was Noah and his family. Um, they were the remnant that he, that he saved because God's word has to go on. And so the idea behind this remnant is that God will always be faithful uh, when his people are not. He's going to always have some folks that are still going to talk about God, love God, worship God, depend on God, trust God. He's going to always have a few, even if everybody else around him is not. So um, the, if, when people turn away from God, um, it's not going to nullify God's promise because he's going to always be there for his people. Um, and so even though sometimes God will push a harsh judgment on his people, like he did here in this, this book of Zephaniah, maybe like he's doing to us now. Um, he does that with the purpose of purifying them, trying to make them better. Uh, he'd rather purify you than destroy you. Um, so um, God is going to always ensure that there's a righteous remnant that's still around to survive. Um, so. But what a glorious day that's going to be when we can look around and see none of the things that are listed here in this verse. Verse 13. God is saying that, the one, that once he removes all of the arrogant, all of the haughty, and all of the prideful people. I mean, he opened up the verse talking about how he's going to, our, 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 our uh, speech is going to be pure. You know, so he, and he's going to remove everybody that don't, oh, prideful and haughty people that don't want to be humble and lowly. He, and so we can all be on one accord. He said, I'm going to remove all the haughty, remove all the prideful, and, and you can get back to pure worship. He says here that people will do no wrong. They will speak no lies. They will have no deceitful tongue at all. And that's far different than where we are today. I ain't even going to talk about some elected people that lie all the time, but uh, it is far different from where we are today. It seems like everybody wants to do wrong. Everybody is lying. People lie when they don't even have to lie. You ever met somebody who, 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 who lie about their name? I mean, they lie about anything, right? They lie when they don't have to lie. If you're going to lie, at least save the lie for when you need to lie. Don't lie when you don't need to lie. I mean, come on. <laughs> but you got people who will lie about anything. You know, I know people who, I, who, who've been lying about everything they've done just to be able to get in the conversation. You know, 
feel like I, if I don't say I, I did this, I can't be in the conversation. Just don't be in the conversation. You ain't got to lie. Um, or you just want to make yourself look better than what you are. Um, I don't know. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it. Um, the only person that we should care about is what God thinks about us, not what other people think about us. Um, but this verse here says that uh, there would be no deceitful tongue found anywhere. And this is what life is going to be like in heaven. And that's kind of, and I'm not really going deep into this book of Zephaniah, but God is also, Zephaniah is also talking about the day when all of us Christians are in heaven and Jesus comes back to earth a second time. This is how it's going to be, but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> um, nobody's going to be telling a story. Nobody's going to be telling a lie. Everything out of everybody's mouth will be pure. Uh, he goes on to say, they shall feed and lie down and nobody should make them afraid. Now, uh, this is where we're going to be when we go to heaven, y'all. God gave us a glimpse of this uh, when he had David write in the 23rd Psalms, for he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I will fear no evil. And, and that's just a glimpse right here. When, when he tells them that, that, that in this day, there will be that he'll be so pleased with his people. That he's going to supply their every need. That he would just have them lie down. And he'll bring them food to them on a daily basis. And nobody should be afraid of anything. That, and right now it seems like we live our lives in fear of, it, of what could happen to us. I, I, yeah, I've, been, I've done it too. Right? Um, we live our lives thinking about what possibly could go wrong. Always trying to guard against this and guard against that but i'm telling you you could be the healthiest person eat the healthiest things and that you can still die that day um, now being healthy exercising and all of that it gives you a better quality of life while you're here but it won't you can't do anything to change a single minute of how long you're on this earth Anyway, I just threw that in for free. But here God told Zephaniah to tell the people that nobody should be afraid. Uh, and when you trust in the Lord, no one should be afraid. If you truly trust in the Lord, you don't have to worry about uh, what you might go through. Uh, but just know who's going to go through it with you, right? I, I know that's hard to do. But um, that's the attitude we should try to get to. And that's a totally different picture uh, than the picture you see uh, in the first eight verses because the people were full of lies at that time and full of deceit. So, um, so that kind of ends our lesson for the week. Um, there was a lot in those, first, in those five verses, but it was something that we can all learn from. Um, uh, I, I, I hope that you're enjoying these lessons. I really look forward to next week's lesson uh, as we close out our three-part series on the uh, third chapter of Zephaniah. Um, and remember to please continue to share these lessons with people. Um, maybe there's other churches who are not having Sunday school during this time. Just forward the, the, the link or hit the share button or, or whatever. And let's just try to continue to get that word out there for folks. Um, because this word does speak to us if you really listen. And God has uh, blessed me with the ability to kind of break it down in more um, of a way that you can understand it and, and see what it means for you today. So please continue to share these lessons. Please continue to comment on them because, like I said, it helps me. It encourages me. And it also um, entices other people to, to, to look at it. Um, so anyway, with that, let's continue to pray for each other during this pandemic um, as we continue to fight our way through. Remember, we have uh, Bible study and prayer on Wednesdays, and then uh, pastor will be doing his normal uh, uh, sermon and everything on Sundays. And like we say every week, may the Lord watch between me and thee. While we're absent, one from another, amen. And this concludes Sunday School with the Deacon.